Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! today to answer questions. We know that your time is limited, but we've got quite a lot of ground to cover relating to the House of Commons resolution of the 1st of November, which instructed the government to give to this committee the impact assessments arising from the sectoral analyses that you have undertaken on Brexit. Now, you told the House in your written statement of the 7th of November that, and I quote, it is not the case that 58 sectoral impact assessments exist, end of quote. So is it your contention that the reason why you have not handed over the impact assessments is because you don't have them? Is that yes, correct? Th there, is a, there is a formal definition of impact assessments in, uh, followed by the civil service, I think published by the Better Regulation Task Force, or Better Regulation Unit anyway, um, uh, which lays out what they are. And we don't, that's not the form of the sexual analyses. The sexual analyses, um, which, uh, which were uh, which were started uh, back in 2016, um, were, are essentially looking at what the industries consist of, looking at the size of them in terms of revenue and capital and, and um, uh, employment and so on, looking at their involvement in the European market, looking at their regulatory structure and so on. Now, it's all very useful and it's the underpinning of a lot of policy, but it's not a forecast of the outcome of, of uh, leaving the European Union or indeed various options thereof. Uh, so that's the, that's the first reason that, uh, and I think that point has been made uh, to the House uh, in the motion uh, leading the, the, the um, loyal address motion. Um, it's been made by me previously in this committee and in the, I think, in the European Union committee and so on. So what we tried to do was to give you as best we could under the conditions which I specified uh, in the letter to you, which is um, without undermining our negotiating position uh, and without uh, compromising commercial confidenti com confidentiality or sensitivity, um, uh, market sensitive data and so on. Uh, and that's what the, that's the instruction I gave to my department. It's the instruction effectively it gave out to the rest of Whitehall. Remember these sexual analyses are spread out all over Whitehall uh, and the ownership of the information is all over, all over Whitehall. Uh, and that's why we did what we did to give you what we thought was the best we could, or the closest we could come to the, uh, the, uh, House, of, the House of Commons motion. So just to be clear, has the government undertaken any impact assessments on the implications of leaving the EU for different sectors of the Not in sectors, I think. The, the economy. The, 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 what, I'm, uh, what, I, uh, what we do have, or not do have, the, the Treasury, of course, has got an OBR forecast, which uh, has an implication, although even that's pretty crude. That's done from the, um, from the, uh, uh, the average, I think, of all the external forecasts of effect, impact on the economy and so on. So uh, there's nothing. There's there's no there's no sort of systematic uh, uh, impact assessment. So the, the answer to the question no is no. Yeah. So the government hasn't undertaken any impact assessments no. on the implications for leaving of leaving the EU for different sectors of the British economy. Mm. Um, so there isn't one, for example, on the automotive <coughs> sector. On the automotive no, sector, no, not I'm aware of. No. Is there one on aerospace? Not I'm aware of. No. no. Well, on financial services. Well, I think the answer is going to be no to all of them. No to all of them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, doesn't it strike you, Secretary of State, as rather strange, given experience around the committee in which you have, the government undertakes impact assessments on all sorts of things all of the time, mm. that on the most fundamental change that we are facing as a country, mm. you've just told us that the government hasn't undertaken any impact assessments at all looking at the impact on individual yeah, sectors of the economy. The, the first thing to say, um, uh, Mr Chairman, is when these sectoral analyses were initiated, they were done to understand the effect of various options, what the outcome would be. You don't need to do an impact assessment, a formal impact assessment, to understand that if there is a regulatory hurdle between our producers and a market, that they will have an impact, it will have a, a, an effect. Um, the assessment of that effect, I think I've said to you before, is not as straightforward as people imagine. I'm not a, I'm not a 
fan of economic models because they have all proven wrong. When you have a paradigm change, then the, uh, as in happened in 2008, when you had the financial crisis, all the models were wrong. The fact the Queen famously asked, why did we not know? Um, the, uh, similarly, what we're dealing with here, in every outcome, whether it's a, a free trade agreement, whether it's a WTO outcome, or whether it's something between in, in those spectrums, uh, on those spectra, um, the, it's a paradigm change. So we know in terms that the, the sort of the, not the scale, not the size, but the order of magnitude of impact. Now, when we come down, and the second point to make is that when we started the, uh, imp uh, the uh, no, I'm now calling it impact, so <laughs> when we started the sexual analyses, the, um, <clears throat> the I, I did not know in my mind whether we would end up doing an analysis, doing a, uh, a negotiation sector by sector. Right? That was the first thing to understand, whether we did a separate negotiation for, for um, automotive and a separate one for um, financial services and so on. Um, or, or let's say asset managers to pick one out. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. It became very apparent very quickly that was not going to be the approach. The, the approach in the timetable available which would work and which would actually serve our negotiating purpose was an overarching free trade deal. So individual sectoral analyses will not be necessarily informative on that. They're informative in terms of who's vulnerable. I'll come back to that and talk about regional effects in a minute, but it's important to know who's vulnerable, but the actual impact assessment, as you term it, um, uh, was, uh, is not necessary piece by piece. We will at some stage, and some of this has been initiated, we will at some stage do uh, the best we can to quantify the effect of different negotiating outcomes as we come up to them. Bear in mind we haven't started phase two yet. Uh, in particular, <clears throat> we will try and assess, um, well, in bigger categories, the effect of um, various outcomes in financial services. We will try and assess the effect of various outcomes in uh, in terms of the uh, overarching manufacturing industry, agriculture, and so on. We'll do that a little closer to the negotiating timetable. Now, they fall precisely in that area which I described as negotiation sensitive. So if, for example, I had two options for an industry, A and B, uh, that uh, were negotiating with the European Union, and one of them will be beneficial to the tune of, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, 50 billion, just pick a number out of the air, uh, but, and the other option will be negative by 10 billion. I'm not going to publish that just before I go into negotiation with the Commission. Right. Okay. That's the that's point. Now, when they come, I can tell you they're there, but I can't give them to the committee at that point. Right, well, I'll come on to what you, you haven't given to us, hmm. but... You've, you've just said to us that you, you haven't done that mm. work yet. You've, you've said that there are no impact decisions. Mm. You were hoping that at the October Council, the door would be open to phase two of the negotiations, mm. where the question would be asked, OK, so what does the British government want? Sure. Sure. Are you actually telling us that the government hadn't at that point, and still hasn't, undertaken the assessment that you've just described, which you say we will do at some point, hmm. when you're hoping at the December Council yeah. to open the door to phase I re two I, re I reiterate the point, uh, uh, Mr Chairman. The, uh, the a strategy we decided back way before the, the October Council, before March, indeed before the triggering of um, Article 50, was that we would go for an overarching comprehensive trade deal. That will cover all sectors, not one sector. Um, uh, and within it will be a financial services sector, and then there will be some, some other tiers, some specific ones like data, I think I said to you, and, and so on. You, some of those you can't quantify on data. Data, you could not quantify the impact of data, but it's obviously a highly uh, high effect qualitative okay. impact. Okay. Now, now, no, 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 I'm, I'm quite finished, with, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, the, and therefore, the usefulness of such a detailed impact assessment is, is near zero. And given how we were stretching our resources to get where we were at the time, then it was, it was not a sensible use of resources. Right. Now, if you're saying that the usefulness of that is near zero, why did you tell the Foreign Affairs Committee on the 13th of September 2016, and I quote, 
There is the sectoral analysis. They are working through about 50 cross-cutting sectors. Hmm. What is going to happen to them? That sounds like an impact assessment to me. Hmm. What did Lord Bridges of Headley mean when he told the House of Lords EU Internal Market Subcommittee on the 13th of October 2016 when he said, we have segmented the UK economy into roughly 100 production sectors. We have looked at those to understand the size and contribution that each of these sectors makes to the economy and used that to support our analysis of the impact on them of Brexit. Now, that sounds very clear to me that the government has been looking at the impact on individual sectors, and yet you've told us a moment ago that you haven't done that yet. Yeah, now, which is it? Either it has happened or it hasn't. Yeah, we're talking September 16. <clears throat> where we have basically been in existence over a summer, from, from July, August, September. We were still looking at that point of what strategy we would undertake. Uh, and uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, as you said, what is going to happen? Well, that's the point of the sectoral analysis. You've got in there uh, indications for every industry what the, um, <clears throat> what the uh, uh, regulatory burden or regulatory effect is, what the market sizes are, that's what, uh, that's, the, that's what informs you. And size and contribution, ditto. That's, that should be in the analysis you've been given. But with respect, Secretary of State, that doesn't answer the question I've just asked you, which is, uh, you said that we're looking at what is going to happen to them, referring to cross-cutting sectors, mm. and Lord Bridges said we are using uh, the analysis we've done of uh, 100 production sectors to support our analysis of the impact on them of Brexit. Now, I'm still trying to get well, clear. The fact, the fact he uses the either word, you are looking at the impact, or your department is, or you aren't. But it can't be both. So, which is it? We are looking at the effect. I mean, <clears throat> do not to draw the conclusion that because you use the word impact, that you have written an impact assessment. There is, there is, a, uh, and I took it when Ms. Malhotra, I think, uh, was uh, pressing me on this, that she was looking for a quantitative economic forecast of outcome. That is not there. Yeah, that is not there. We haven't done that. The, uh, what is there is the size of the industry, the, the employment, and so on. That is uh, important, and of course it describes the effect of the policy. And uh, the government, of course, is looking at the effect of the po potential policies, but is not hasn't written an impact assessment. At the point, some of these things will come up with, um, or will come up with that. Uh, 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 in the subsequent primary legislation coming through, we've got some stuff on customs and so on, and in that there will be an impact assessment because an impact assessment is normally normally uh, accompanies uh, a, a bill, and that that will be there. But that's an impact assessment that we're looking at the effect. That's why, in, in response to the, the in response to the motion, we tried to give you as close as we could to what the motion asked for. That is taking the sectoral analyses, making sure they're up to date, making sure that they're, they're accurate. And, and giving them to you. Okay. That's, that's what we did. Now, in answer to a question from Seema Malhotra when you appeared before the Select Committee on the 25th mm. of October 2017, the question was, has the Prime Minister seen the impact assessments? You replied, she will know the summary outcomes yep. of them. Mm. Could you tell us what it was she was looking at? Well, the, she would have been looking at the policy documents put in front of Cabinet and Cabinet committees. The point of the... Um, uh, of the central analyses was to provide the underpinning knowledge and understanding for deciding on various strategies. So, uh, if a, I don't know, a strategy on data was being discussed, then she would, she would know, uh, because in that strategy would be that, what I, the summary outcomes are a very infelicitous, infelicitous phrase, but it's a bit more than conclusions. It will be how regulatory dependent it is, how, uh, how, uh, what the size of the market abroad is, those sorts of things. They will be in the, uh, in the policy uh, papers put to the Prime Minister and to the Cabinet Ministers on that relevant committee, whichever one it may be at the time. So there is material in existence that assesses the impact on different sectors. That's what. Well, it's, it's what it's what you've been given, Mr. Well, Mr. Chairman. I, that's the point. Nothing more than that. You, you, I don't think that is what we've been given. But anyway, we shall come on to that point. You were very straightforward in your letter to me hmm. in saying that there is that certain material that you decided to yeah. withhold from the committee, as you set out in the letter. Hmm. Could you just explain on the record why you took that decision? Yes. Uh, I have responsibilities as a minister, uh, uh, which uh, 
uh, include, of course, uh, protecting the confidence of information given in commercial confidence, right. um, uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, market sensitive information, but most of all in this context, protecting the negotiating position of the British, uh, British government. Uh, that's uh, the uh, necessary position. And some of the uh, the data which we're most sensitive to that will be data prepared just uh, to, to, inf to uh, assess the, um, uh, the <coughs> likely outcome for the UK of uh, individual policies that we agree with the European Union. Okay. That's why. Now, can you point to any wording in the motion of the 1st of November that either instructed or allowed the government to withhold such information before passing it to the committee? And if there isn't, why did the government accept the motion rather than seeking to defeat it or to change it in some other well, way? Well, the, 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 the first thing, as we started out saying, Mr. Chairman, is the motion asks for things that don't exist. That's the point. It asks for things that don't exist. So I tried to get as close to that as I could with, uh, with the, within the uh, parameters that my duties as a minister allow. The second element of why we vote, voted or didn't vote, I'm afraid it would not be wise for me to pass comment on decisions made by uh, Chief Whips. It would be probably more than my life would be worth. <laughs> Almost sounds like an expression of regret, but I, I won't read anything into what you've just said. Uh, I, I say what I say, uh, Chairman. I do not express regrets or otherwise unless I say so. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Um, Seema Malhotra. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretary of State, for coming to give evidence today. Could I ask you first, did the committee get in the two Leverage files, the 800 pages, the studies that existed before and were referred to as completed in the freedom of information response I received from your department on the 29th of September? I don't remember the freedom of information request. What date was it? it, it well. It was a no, no, it's important. The, the also, date is, the date is important. Said, sorry, Mahata, the date is important, please. Yes, it, it was the 29th of September. However, you had also of this said... Year. Of this year. Of this year, yeah, okay. yes. However, you had also said on the Andrew Marr show that the studies were completed, and you'd said that in June 2017. Yeah. So I just want to understand whether what we've received yeah. are the same documents as you had re reports, as you had said, were... Completed. Well, I think you've got my permanent secretary coming on later and he can tell you exactly how they were uh, adduced, but I'll give, give you my attempt. These... Um, oh, sorry, sorry, Secretary. I, I, oh, no, I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm give give you a attempt, full answer. I think it's a fairly straightforward question to ask you whether what you have given to this committee in these two lever arch files are the same reports as you had seen and had said publicly in June, and that's why, that's why I'm going to give you a full answer, reiterated. if you forgive me. Okay, you, know, you. you did ask me once before to, to give you yes or no answers, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't a very informative outcome. The, um, these, these reports were started, uh, actually, I think I commissioned them in the first week uh, of, the, uh, of the existence of the department, uh, and they have been evolving over time, so none of them are static. Uh, new things come in, new understandings of the information, new comments from the industry. You read every day in the Financial Times comments from various industries, uh, which is why I ask you the date. Right? So, uh, the, uh, and what has been done in producing these reports is these, and oh, the other thing that's happened over the course of that time is they started as just DEXU documents, but they've become documents belonging to all the various departments as they update them and inform their, their own policies as, um, uh, along the way. Uh, so, the uh, the documents you'll give, bear in mind there's some things not in them, uh, 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 because of, of what I said, they will be uh, as up-to-date as possible. So very likely, the 29th of September, then, if there's anything that's not the same as that, it'll be things that have added in afterwards. So I am not sure if I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, Say again, sorry. Are, are these the same reports that were completed and you publicly stated were completed? Or as have, I said, you, have they had as I said, you, the word "complete" it means we've we've written a report. It doesn't mean that they stay the same. They've been evolving over the entire 18 months or more, whatever it is, since uh, since they were first commissioned. Okay, are these? You said that these reports hadn't been edited as well, and there hasn't and they haven't been redacted. So, I'm one. I'm trying to understand whether what we've received are reports. <coughs> that have effectively been largely written in the last three weeks, 
uh, or whether they are indeed the reports the, the, they're, they're compiled that have from been the, shared with the Cabinet Committee and subcommittees, as you've just described. They are, they are compiled from the existing reports. That's, that was the intention. That's what, and uh, as I say, my permanent secretary will give you the detail of it when he, when he comes up. Secretary, when did you share the findings of the sectoral analyses with the cabinet committees and subcommittees, as you've just described, which would have been what the Prime Minister saw? I can't remember the individual dates, but there will be part, and not all of them will have yet made their way to the, to the, uh, the, the policy conclusion stage. Um, but there were a number of uh, policy analyses, uh, sorry, policy proposals um, over the course of the summer in particular. You will have seen we published 14 papers. The backdrop to that would have been these reports, amongst many, many other things. The civil service is very good at keeping records. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be prepared to share with the committee the date that some of these reports were well, shared with Cabinet? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, the audit trail you're asking for, it would be sort of quite extraordinary. I'm trying to find out. Uh, when I answered your question before, I said summary outcomes. It's an infelicitous, it's an inelegant phrase, but basically a summary <laughs> outcome. In other words, the information has arisen from this report. These reports, these sectoral analyses were there to inform departments on uh, you know, what their own industries, their client industries, uh, would face in the event of various outcomes in the uh, in the, in the um, departure from the European Union, they're, they're not you know they're not they're sort of, they, they aren't sort of chunked in sort of Lego block like and they will just inform it. That's why I said summary outcomes rather than summaries. Right, Secretary of State, um, the uh, chair of the committee uh, just asked you about an exchange you had in the Lords in September 2016. Following that exchange in the Lords, you had an exchange in giving evidence to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee where you were asked by um, Mike Gapes MP whether you were going to be doing a quantitative assessment of the impact of various scenarios on sectors. In your response, you said, what I said is that we will, be car carry, out, we will carry out quantitative assessments and of course, some of the information will come from businesses. You made it very clear that you will um, be testing that data, you will be looking at how it's calculated, and that you, in your department, would be undertaking that assessment. That was in September 2016. Mm. Did you undertake that assessment? Oh, no, as, as I said, I said to the chairman earlier, um, and that was at that stage. You were not clear whether or not we would do a sector by sector negotiation. The uh, the situation now is we are likely to we're going to do a, we're going to attempt an overarching negotiation with some components of it. As I said, to the chairman, at the point that we've got the options available in front of us, we will assess them. Now, a quantitative assessment is not as people keep. Uh, and I, I have to be very clear with you, Ms. Mahatra, because... I don't you have, understand no, 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 that, let me finish. I'm what did clear you intend you. when you said that you were going no, to be doing a quantitative me. assessment over a year ago, yeah. and then you, and following that, you said, when you asked when it was going to happen, you said that the department has doubled in one month, this was September 2016, mm. I suspect it will double in size again, and it was about that point that we will be looking for the information. Information, exactly. A quantitative assessment is not an economic forecast. So, for example, the size of the British car industry is a very important part of the, uh, uh, of the assessment of how, how much effort we put and how much negotiating capital we expend in terms of protecting it. Actually, that won't be an issue now because we'll be doing it in manufacturing in total, not just the one industry. And we'll assess it in a way appropriate to, on the basis of the information you have, in a way appropriate to the negotiating aims we have at each stage. So, Secretary say it would appear that you intended to do quantitative analysis, uh, impact assessment in no, the way, in, no, from, no, no, from, from what you described. One of, the, one of the problems here, Ms. Mahatma, is that you use the word impact assessment. I've been using the word sexual analysis. They are different, right? And people seem to assume that impact assessment consists of a quantitative forecast. As we have said, as the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England has said, as any number of people have said, so these economic forecasts do not work. Sorry, Secretary, I'll just move on. I will just, uh, before I, 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 I ask be you rude. a final question, I'll just, uh, we, will, we won't dwell on it, but on the 2nd of February 2017, when you were introducing the White Paper, mm -hmm. you said we continue to analyse the impact of our exit yeah. across the breadth of the economy. If I could just ask you this, Secretary of State, mm -hmm. is it true you said at Tory party conference this year that if the outcome of the negotiations falls short of the deal, we will be ready for the alternative. That is what a responsible government does. 
anything else would be a dereliction of duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And what was meant by that? That was in the context of contingency planning. Um, and we have a very major, it's not in this, but we have a very major contingency planning operation underway. But you've confirmed today that you have not undertaken an assessment of the impact of different scenarios yeah. on the economy. But, but that, but they're different things. Uh, the, the contingency planning will look at, for example, how one facilitates, uh, in the example you're talking about, no deal, how one facilitates customs traffic with that minimum inconvenience uh, with, uh, uh, if we don't have a customs arrangement, uh, how one ensures that we have bilateral aviation deals that are in place on the day we leave so there's no hiccup there, how one ensures that you have an independent nuclear inspection authority uh, in, order to, uh, in order to make sure that you can continue trade in fissile materials. Uh, how you ensure that you cannot be stopped from pre pre presenting, uh, from using data from the European Union because you more than meet the, uh, the requirements of the European Union. All those sorts of things, they don't have numbers attached to them, they have actions of practical facts. Did you this agree is, this then, is why so, I keep sorry, saying so to you, say, don't you, conflate agree, that with some sort of forecast. Then did you agree with the findings of the leaked Department of Health study that said a hard Brexit would leave the NHS short of 40,000 nurses by 2026? No, I, well, it, it, I don't comment on leaked documents, but if you why if don't you rephrase that as do I think it will cause a shortage of nurses? Because if you do, the answer is no. Well, could I ask you finally, just one last more question. Mm. I just want to ask you again, Secretary of State, if you could provide at least the date that the assessments, that the an analyses that you undertook went to Cabinet or Cabinet Subcommittee, bearing in mind that the Civil Service will have records of documents that you it did will, share. It will, they, as I said to you, that I used the phrase with you, it wasn't a very elegant one, but it, it was an accurate one, uh, the, that uh, outcomes. That means policy documents which are presented on the basis of the analysis at that point in time, which is what you've got here. Right. John Whittingdale. Um, Thank you. You've made clear that the analyses are an evolving process. So would it be correct to say that the documents we have in front of us, which were given to us on the 27th of November, if you were to give us the same documents today, they would be different to the ones that we received at that time? Very slightly in that time. <laughs> right, but the, they are constantly e e e Yeah, they're constantly evolving. Evolution takes place at different rates. It's taking place at a very, very fast rate in 2016, rather slow in 2017. Okay. Um, you have indicated to us in private that there are some aspects of, within the document that might that would not be obvious uh, or in the public domain, but in the large part they are fairly anodyne and largely consist of material that I think you could get out of the Guttings files. Um, you have also made clear that they do not refer to individual companies. Now, government departments will be talking to individual companies within their sectors the whole time. And when it comes to a major uh, investor, such as an international car manufacturer, they will be talking about their future investment plans, whether or not a particular outcome might affect uh, their decision in terms of how much to source from this country. Now that information will be presumably provided to your department, but it just won't be in the sectoral analyses. Not if it, not if, not if it impacts directly on their, uh, on their individual market uh, rating and so on. Although there are, uh, let me think, in the fintech sector, for example, there were explicit statements so they would have to move some of their offices abroad, and they're put in there because uh, although uh, although they're, as I say, slightly difficult in negotiating terms, frankly, uh, that's small bit by comparison with the importance of no, no final committee, but yes. Yeah. yeah. So what, I, what I'm seeking to get at is the sectoral analyses which you have given us are one component of the overall process that has been conducted. Mm -hmm. There will be other material which will have been supplied probably in confidence to individual departments which will be held within your department but not in these sets of analyses but in perhaps other forms. Mm. That's, yes, that's true. Okay. And do you think that the European Commission is conducting a similar exercise? Um, not, not on this scale in the UK. They will have been consulting with individual European governments. 
Um, there will be a, there will be a bandwidth issue for them um, uh, when it comes to the next stage of the negotiation, which is the one that is, is, is affected by all this. Um, uh, but they will they will be consulted mostly, I think, with uh, with governments, and presumably their trade commissioner will provide it some some input to it. Uh, but we won't know because, as they say in their in their guidelines to uh, to the Parliament, they don't release everything they have. Yeah. Now that was essentially what I was getting at. So Mr. Barnier will be sitting opposite you. He will have his own set of uh, analyses uh, and documents prepared by his officials, but none of those have been or will be made public. No, that's that. Well, they have. They, I think if you look at the guidelines, there's an explicit statement um, that uh, that they will withhold things which would undermine negotiation. Right. Which is why, by the way, Mr. Whitney, when in the first instance talking to the European Union. Committee of the Lords, I said we'll be as open as we can be, but not. Um, uh, and, and the way one test of that will be give as much. We'll give as much as the Commission gives to the European Parliament. We will give at least as much to the British Parliament. Okay. Thank you. Just on that point, uh, Secretary of State, you did indeed give that commitment to me that we would be kept <coughs> as least as well informed as members of the European Parliament. This week, the Brexit steering group in Brussels was briefed on the draft text, as we understand it, that was to be discussed. And we know that because Mr Lambert, who is a Green member of the European Parliament, came out and said what was in it. Now, is, doesn't that not demonstrate that members of the European Parliament are, are being better briefed than members of the well, House of Commons? The, 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 the question is Europe members. This is, a, this is a Brexit steering group, which is the guidance group for, uh, for, the, um, for the Task Force 50. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of the overall Parliament. Uh, in truth, I could probably find other areas where you've got more information, this is one of them, uh, right now, um, than, than they have. And what they were seeing was their negotiating stance, no more than that. But given that we, we know that members of that steering big group are being briefed on text that is being discussed, yeah. is well, that something that you would let me, do with members of the committee or well, the House? What, what I've done, I mean, just, just so the committee knows, I mean, um, I'm not sure quite how indelicate this is, it'll probably get me into trouble, but um, last year I nominated Mr. Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, I beg his pardon, yeah. I not, didn't nominate him, I, I put in a request that Her Majesty would uh, appoint him to her Privy Council. The reason for doing so, much as I admire him, was not that. It was because uh, I wanted to be able to brief him on uh, a day-to-day -day basis on some of the inward negotiations. And on Privy Council terms, um, that's what I've done from time to time. Um, and on Privy Council terms, I could do the same for any Privy Council member of this committee, but I would restrict it to that at this stage, if that's what you want. I mean, I, I say, I, I, I add that rider, Mr. Mr. Chairman, because you will remember, uh, I can't tell Mr. Maholt for the date, but we had a conversation in the uh, uh, committee behind, uh, in the corridor behind the chair some time ago when I was trying to get to you as quickly as possible the, uh, the white paper on the bill that's now in front of the House, and it was being held up in, Whitehall, in the Whitehall round. Um, by uh, approval procedure. So I said to you at the time, I'll show you one on Privy Council terms, and you demurred because you didn't want to see things your committee couldn't see. All right? So I'd, I'd taken that as a guidance. Uh, uh, no, I, but if I'm wrong, please correct me. Well, the, the committee acts as one, but that, 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 is that, that was my Jeremy point. Lefroy. That no, was no, I appreciate the point. Yes, indeed. Jeremy Lefroy. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary of State, for your time. Um, and thank you also for that uh, comment about on Privy uh, Council terms, which I think is incredibly helpful and useful. And also thanks for all the work going into these documents, um, which I also find, found very, very informative. I think my only question is what I and my constituents and probably other colleagues' constituents really want and need to know is information regarding major impact on, for instance, their jobs or incomes or on tax revenues and hence public services which they receive, that that information, which obviously comes uh, to you and is of necessity often confidential, that you and your colleagues are absolutely in the position where you're protecting the interests of my constituents, of other colleagues' constituents and indeed the whole country's uh, interests in those two specific areas, i.e. jobs, livelihoods and tax revenues for, for public services. I think to cut to the chase on this, this is what we need to know. 
that that is happening. We don't all need to know the details of that. We don't need to know um, the, the specifics, but where there are those major impacts, that they are being considered and our negotiation yeah. position is adjusted in accordance with protecting those interests of mine and other constituents. Yes, and Mr. Lefroy, I mean, in the first instance, that was part of the point, and it's become almost a total point of the sectoral analyses. You don't have, and, and as I've said before, you don't have to do a, ma a, a complicated calculation to know that if the chemical industry um, has got a problem exporting its goods, it's going to have an implication for the northeast. Or if the steel industry has a, a problem exporting its goods, it has an implication for Wales, uh, or the finance industry, London. Um, so yes, and indeed, you, you point to another rather important one, which isn't really dealt with in the in the um, sectoral analyses. Um, uh, and that is the um, tax revenue base, because one of the reasons for uh, the concern about the city uh, is that we need to protect the tax revenue base there because it's very, very large. Um, and those calculations will only be possible when, uh, when we know what the range of options are, whether it's alignment, all the argument of yesterday on full alignment, uh, whether it's uh, mutual recognition uh, of, of, a, of a different sort, or whether it's full, you know, it's a complete convergence. Those sorts of things, those decisions will not be taken on ideological grounds, they'll be uh, accepted as much as we've got to deliver on the referendum. We will look at that uh, in mathematical or quantitative, not mathematical, quantitative grounds as and when is necessary for the decision to be taken. You will be pleased to know that the um, Chancellor accused me once of being an extreme pragmatist. I haven't yet decided whether to sue. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. That, that was a very helpful exchange because I've got a number of members still to come in. Okay, can we, can, I mean, I'm really tight. No, time. I know you are, yeah, and, and therefore um, short questions from members Please. and succinct answers. As you demonstrated in the House yesterday, Stephen Toomes. Thank you, Mr. You told us this morning that the documents released to us in these two Lever Arch folders were compiled from the government's existing sectoral reports. Yeah. Um, we've got about 850 pages here. How, how long are the full sectoral reports? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. It may be my firm secretary does, um, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's not a large amount of extraction, and one of the reasons I don't know, however, is, is as I said, these things are evolving. There are at least three phases of rewrites of these things along the way. Um, the first round, um, to be frank, uh, I don't want to be rude about my own department, to be frank, weren't all that good. You know, some of them were written in a hurry, so some were rewritten, uh, and second phase and third phase. So. There's, um, uh, I don't know, but I don't think it's a very large re re removal uh, 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 or uh, abstraction. I don't okay. think it's very large. But again, as I say, I, I'll put that question to my perm sec. He, he may know the answer. Okay, well, perhaps I can do that if the chair allows me. Can I, uh, who was responsible for deciding which material from the, the larger sectoral report should yeah. be included in, in what's been released? The departments involved broadly. Um, so, I mean, I laid down the um, uh, the. Uh, uh, the guideline of uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the two or three exemptions, um, but beyond that, it was down to de the, the, their department and our department uh, and the individual mechanics. I didn't look at, as I said to you earlier, I abstracted myself from even reading them at that, that oh, stage. What, what were the two or three exemptions? What uh, were uh, would uh, undermine or, or, or cause difficulties? I can't remember the exact phrase now, but cause difficulties in negotiation. Uh, commercial confidentiality and commercial sensitivity, those are the sort of three things. Sorry, I only caught two of those. Uh, 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 Second two are commercial confidentiality and commercial sensitivity, e.g. it's something would comment on a, comment on a change, of, um, change of share price, market price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that sounded like two things. But well, that's that's two things. That, those are two guiding principles. The, the, number one was undermining the government's negotiating yeah. position, and number two was commercial conflict. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and who then applied those two criteria? The individual departments. I mean, I'm, I I don't know wh 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 at which sort of level it was. Again, my perm sec will tell you that. I think. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Stephen Crack. Um, since July 2016, whenever members of this House or the other places asked for reassurance that there are smart people across government thinking through systematically our national interest in these negotiations and the risks and opportunities 
Um, we've been treated to an enormous range of descriptions of the kind of work that's going on. So we've been talked of fine-grained analysis, sectoral analysis, impact assessments, quantitative approaches, mathematical approaches, empirical approaches, broad brush analysis, fine-grained analysis, and probably lots more. Um, you can understand why probably members of the committee and others have been feeling a little bit bamboozled by this. And from what you've said today, not all of this work has been undertaken yet. Some of it's been, been, been completed. I think what I'd be interested to know is how is this material actually being used in shaping our negotiating strategy? And you just mentioned a moment ago mm. a couple of iterations of reports weren't very good. Mm. Can you assure us, first of all, that those not very good documents didn't go into shaping our negotiating strategy? Yeah. But more seriously, can you just tell us how, in a practical way, this material is being used in shaping our red lines, what's being left on the table, what's being left off the table as we, yeah. as we take these forward? Uh, First thing, I have not used phrases like impact assessment except to say we don't have one. I mean, that's, that's not my phrase. Uh, sectoral analysis was used for a real reason. It's the analysis of what the sector looks like. Um, as we, uh, what's being, what, the, 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 you'll be a, actually very familiar, uh, Ms. Crabb, the, with the process of government, and there are, there are a number of EU XT committees, the Strategic Negotiating Committee, the Trade Committee, and so on and so on. And when a document, uh, when a proposal, a policy proposal is put to them, it will be informed by these documents, but not just by these documents. Um, uh, the Treasury will have its own inputs. Some of that will come from the uh, massive outreach program that's gone on with, uh, with British industry. I mean, my department, for example, has done about 350 uh, uh, contacts with uh, British industry, 100 from outside London, um, but around Whitehall thousands have been made and the, imp and the inputs from that will feed the, uh, the policy creation process. But some, some of it is also down to simple logistical planning. I mean, I, I mentioned customs before. Department of Tr uh, Transport and HMRC have got practical things they're looking at. We've been building new software systems and so on. So it's a huge, complex program. Uh, and I think, I, I don't know about smart people around Whitehall, but people around Whitehall uh, are, are putting in a huge uh, effort to ensure that the best possible outcome is available for the three or four possible range of outcomes, I guess. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, Craig McKinley. Thank you. Um, would it be fair to say, Secretary of State, that um, when these, I suppose, potted, potted arrangements of all the vast amount of data, I can't imagine how much has gone into then pot it down to this, would it, be real, would it be fair to say that you haven't then looked at them and then gone, no, cross that through, cross that through, cross that through? You've, you've given those three criteria to your, uh, yeah. your people, yeah. and they have done that in an open and honest way, and you've, you've left it at that. You know, I can imagine you haven't got time in the day to then take a black, black mark appendix. Yes, that's right. I was, I, to, 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 for absolute complete transparency on it, I was provided with uh, a sample of two of the chapters in the week before they were given to the committee. Uh, I didn't read them deliberately, because I took the view that I wanted to be able to say, I'm you know, this and this, and frankly, there's no way I'd have a chance to read all 850 no. pages. So You mentioned at the start that, uh, you know, that the Commission is not this omnipotent being, and I don't suppose Whitehall is either. Would, would it be fair to say, I mean, when you look at the different reports from the committees of this House, we often cover the same ground, and we probably could have had the same people come to give evidence and just, just read what they said before to another uh, committee. But would, would there be reports from Treasury, from DEFRA, from Department of Transport, DCMS, that are almost doing some replication of what you're doing, which may be useful to bits that your department uh, are up to, that you would never see because they're just doing their own thing. So if we were to try and get an assessment of you know, the whole picture, mm. it would be rather wider than your department. And I'm, I'm, I'm just another thought. I, I, I would imagine you've got accounting and consulting firms, you've got the industry bodies, probably doing their own stuff on you know, the automotive sector or whatever. And, and I'm guessing, because we see reports all over the place, those three departments, yours, the consulting sector and the uh, industry body, might come up with three different assessments of the same thing. They might. I mean, my, my department, uh, as I think I told the committee the first time I appeared before it, is um, to a very large extent a coordinating department. It, pull, it pulls a lot of this together. Um, but uh, very often you'll have a report written 
for a cabinet committee or for right round, which is between two departments. So we do one. The most common example of that is us and Treasury together. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and so that it will be informed by different things. Um, secondly, in terms of your comment about external analyses, the, this is not a hard dividing line. Um, uh, the OBR estimates um, published in the budget, I think I'm right in saying, I mean, uh, please don't hold me to this, but I think I'm right in saying, uh, are based on, I mean, the, the estimate of the effect of Brexit is based on the average of about, well, more than half a dozen external analyses. So they do rest on each other sometimes. Mm. And, and sometimes I have seen documents come, come in from other departments where they've basically taken an outside analysis and used it for their own purposes. So, so it's a mixture of both. Okay. And it's probably the case I've not seen every document. <laughs> uh, just, just very finally, um, you said the bandwidth of the Commission is pretty narrow. Um, do you think... That was, that was not intended to be... No, 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 no uh, but uh, I can really understand that they have 20 reality, countries yeah. to, to yeah. consider. Do you think the provision of this information to them, who, you know, let's be frank, are trying to extract a huge sum out of British taxpayers, mm. do you think this gives them information that is useful for their no, negotiation it's, it's, positions? Look, it's, this, this information, um, I'll take Mr Whittingdale's comment on it being bland, is boring but important. Uh, so it would save them a lot of work. That's simple truth. I mean, it's probably, I don't know how many man years, I mean, we could estimate it, but it's probably tens or mm. 50 man years or more in it around Whitehall from, actually, from experts, from the best people around Whitehall to do it. So it is, you know, it's beneficial to, uh, to, to an outsider. That's why I made the point earlier. Uh, you know, it, it would help them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. But could you also just confirm for the record, as you made clear, the material you have given does not contain commercially market or negotiation sensitive information. That is, that the, is the intention. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Uh, Jacob rees -Mogg. Thank you, Thank you, Secretary of State, for coming in. My concern is solely that you have met the terms of the humble address that I think the government is entitled to keep the negotiations confidential, but it also has an obligation to the House of Commons. As I understand your evidence, the humble address asked for impact assessments arising from those analyses. Impact assessments is a technical term, and in accordance with that technical term, no such impact assessments exist. Is that my correct understanding? That is basically correct, yes. And therefore it follows that actually the government has gone beyond the requirements of the humble address. The government could simply have said, this does not exist, we're not giving you anything because we cannot provide the committee with something that does not exist. Is that also correct. Uh, technically, that's correct, yes. No. And so, in fact, you have responded rather than meanly and in a redacted sense, generously and fully to the requirements of the humble address by providing 800 pages of information that is not, in fact, an impact assessment because those do not exist, but is pulling together as far as possible the sectoral assessments that have already been done. It is getting as close as we can to meeting what we took to be the intent of Parliament. In achieving that, Mr. Riesmog, I also read, as you know, I couldn't make the debate myself, I also read the, uh, the speech particularly of, Mr. Uh, of Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, and in it he said, you know, they accepted gisting and, uh, and redaction and so on. What we've tried to do is be as full as possible within that context. I mean, you may, you may you, given that you, you all know Whitehall, you will probably be able to work out that the pressure from Whitehall was to give uh, summaries, gists, and so on. I resisted that. We could have, we could have sent two-page summaries on these sectors. We didn't. So, in, in a sense, you have looked at the wording of what turns out to be an incompetent motion, and then at the debate that surrounded it, and tried to fulfil yes. the requirements of the House of Commons in spirit, even though, in fact, you could have rejected it altogether. Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Peter Bell. Chairman. Um, you also have to look, do you not, Secretary of State, at the motion that was passed by the House of Commons on the 7th of December 2016 by a majority of 373, which was amended to say, there should be no disclosure of material that could be reasonably judged to damage the UK in any negotiations to depart from the European Union. That was agreed by 373. Now, it's my view that if, the, if Parliament, or at least if the House of Commons, passes a motion, the government at least has to take that in high regard. I actually think it should act upon it. 
Then, of course, there was the motion on the 1st of November 2017, which said the impact assessments arising from those analyses be provided to the Committee on Exiting the European Union. And that was passed by the House. But as Mr Rees-Mogg has said, of course, you, didn't, you couldn't comply with that because there were no impact assessments. I would suggest to you it was slightly unfortunate that the government did not move an amendment to say, to that motion, to say there should be no disclosure of material that could be reasonably judged to damage the UK in any negotiations to depart from the European Union, which was the earlier motion passed by the House. Now, is it my understanding, is it your understanding, that you took that motion on the 7th of December 2016 into account when you prepared the documents that were presented to this committee? Well, yes it is, but from the context of what, really what Mr rees Mogger said, um, uh, yes it is. Um, we did the best we could, uh, meeting all, all the clashing requests and, and duties. I mean, the point I'm making to you is um, the decision not to undermine our negotiating position is not a, um, a sort of leisurely request or consideration for me, it's my duty. Yeah. Thank you. Right, uh, Richard Graham. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to explore how an impact assessment could be done in a particular important sector. Um, let me take finance. Um, a potential future free trade agreement with the US would be incredibly important to our finance sector because 50% of all US financial services business with the EU is with the UK alone. So if a UK-US FTA, including financial services, were signed, it would have a significant impact on our single largest tax-generating sector. But informally, it's also clear from American colleagues that US interest depends on what our future relationship with the EU will be, and in specific, regulatory alignment and future maintenance of EU laws. So our degree of future autonomy is, in effect, the key determinant on US interest and our combined value in any potential future relationship. Given that under the US phasing structure there be no talks yet on the future relationship, how could you do an impact assessment on the financial sector? <laughs> well, with some difficulty is, is, the, uh, is, the, is the first question. The, the real problem for an impact assessment on the financial sector is the sheer range of potential outcomes and the extent to which the industry itself will uh, respond um, to, let's say, requirement to put euro clearing inside, inside the eurozone and so on. Now, in the course, I mean, we're talking about things evolving over time. In the course of the last 12 months, the stance of various significant members of the city, because you know better than most, Mr. Graham, that it's not a single entity. It may be a single organism, but it's not a single entity, has changed from a, oh my God, we're going to have to move all our business abroad, I mean, I'm, I'm, para, I'm caricaturing, bluntly, to, well, actually, we might be able to put head off, uh, head, small head offices in Frankfurt or whatever, and then have the huge back office back in the UK. Now, which of those options they take and how many of them take them will, um, uh, will determine, to a large part, an impact assessment. And which of those options they take may alter depending on whether we get an, inter, uh, uh, an implementation period in the first quarter of next year. Indeed, I would guarantee it would alter, right? So it's one of the reasons that has driven the, the uh, pursuit of uh, 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 an implementation period. So it's incredibly difficult to get point, a point answer to these things. Indeed, I was just looking at the, um, the 2030 Better Regulation Manual, which has the impact assessment definition. It, <coughs> it describes it as a continuous process to help the policymaker fully think through and understand the consequences of possible and actual government interventions in the public, private and third sectors. It makes the point it's a continuous process and it changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Grant. Thank you very much, Jim. Secretary of State, can I take you back to the quote that I think Seema reminded you of earlier on? Um, when you told the House on the 2nd of February, we continue to analyse the impact of our exit across the breadth of the UK economy covering more than 50 mm. sectors. Those were the words to which the humble address motion referred, uh, referred to the answer to a written question, which referred to another written question, which referred explicitly to those words from yourself. Well, 
I didn't, so see in the, I didn't see it in the motion, Mr Grant. I saw the call for no, the, 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 With respect, the humble address referred explicitly to the answer to question 239 yeah. of the 30th of mm. March. Question 239 oh, referred right. explicitly okay. to yeah. an earlier question, mm. um, whose number I have down here somewhere from February 2017, I think. Yeah. Um, but if you follow back the precise references in those questions, it is unambiguous that the decision, the, 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 the binding and effective decision of the House on the 1st of November referred to what you yourself have described as analysing the impact of our exit across the breadth of the UK uh, economy. Um, it doesn't ask for forecasts, it doesn't ask for predictions, it asks for the analysis of the impact. Could you explain why you've chosen to use a definition from the civil service of an impact assessment as opposed to an analysis of the impact? What's the difference between those two? Well, the, the, the use of a single word in a single question over the course of two years does not tell you that impact assessments exist. It just says I've used the word impact. Uh, I don't really think that's a, a particularly logical connection. What I've done, as I've explained just to the two previous questioners, is we've got as close as we can to what we think the House of Commons was after, given what we have and in the time available. Remember, I put the three-week uh, sorry, three week timetable on this to say you've got to, you've got to do it in that time to, to meet the House's requirements. But that, that doesn't say that impact ex uh, assessments exist. It doesn't. Yeah. I have never said that. Not ever. For the purpose of the record, Chair, can I uh, advise that um, the initial question was number <coughs> 69306 of the 30th of March 2017. But Secretary of State, um, you're now telling us that the reason you can't provide what is asked for is because it doesn't exist, but it didn't exist at the time that it was asked for. Why is it then that throughout the entire debate on the 1st of February, when Robin Walker and Steve Baker spoke on behalf of the government, at no point did they say this, these documents do not exist. There was vague references to it's not the case that we have 58 separate sectoral analysis and so on. At no point in the debate did either of them say we have not done an impact assessment. I don't, I don't have the hands on in front of me, but I think you'll find that no, Mr Robin Walker did actually say that the impact assessments don't exist, but sectoral analyses do. OK. Well, we'll have a look. Would you accept, though, that the thrust of the government's argument, which I, I would imagine you um, contributed to, although you weren't able to be part of the debate, um, was about possible damage to the national interest if some of this information came out? Um, in fact, almost everyone who spoke um, against the motion um, was making it perfectly clear that their concern was that it could damage the negotiating position mm -hmm. if some of this information came out. Is it not the case that any member of parliament who thought that parliament was about to take a decision that seriously damaged the national interest is under an absolute requirement to oppose that, even if it means that they have to step aside from a part of it, and even in the case of a minister, it means they have to resign from the government beforehand? That, that is the expectation of a minister. If they think that parliament is about to take a decision that seriously damages the national interest, the expectation is that minister will resign in order to vote against the government. But on a, on a motion that asks us to do something which is technically not possible, even though we've done the best we can to get close to it. Okay, so, sorry, so, sorry, so, I mean, your, what your statement, statement is, is sort of your views, so nothing more than that. Can I suggest to you, Secretary of State, that the fact that nobody on the government side was concerned enough about damaging the national interest to resign from the government, but were indeed to re resign from the government, indicates that the arguments about the national interest are a smokescreen. Isn't it the case that the reason the government didn't oppose this was because they thought they could ignore a humble address in exactly the same way as they've ignored almost every backbench and opposition day debate for the last two years? That you made well, a mistake. No, I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a peculiar test and rather convoluted one you're putting. The simple truth is there are pieces of information which, if released, would undermine the negotiating position. That ought to be pretty self-evident, uh, and it's the case. Okay. D sorry, we, D Peter. We, um, we, Mr. Mr. I know. Chairman, I'm very. I'm, I'm, I'm late now, so I'm worrying. I know. I've got. Just move. Well, I've got. Chair, two, I'm hang on. Bothered, bothered. Could I remind you, Chair, that the very clear instruction from Mr. Speaker was that there was nothing the Secretary of State could have in his diary that was more important than coming to give an account of himself we to are, this committee. We are all very aware of that, but well, we also well, needed. Hang on. We need to. A motion of the House commend the Secretary of State to stay. And the, the, the no, well, I, if, if we spend less time discussing it, we can just get in uh, one question for the last two people and then we can release the Secretary of State. John Fenton. Yes, uh, briefly, Chairman. Thank yeah. you, Secretary of State. Um, uh, companies will often provide uh, uh, information to government, uh, co commercially sensitive information, based on assurances from government, sometimes assurances given in writing that that information will remain confidential. 
Um, I would find it hard to believe that none of the information provided in these files, let alone the redacted information, wasn't given on that basis. So to the extent that these files were made public, would there be a major exercise involved in going back to those companies to get permission? That's, that's one of the reasons I asked for the committee to come back to us with whatever it wants to publish. Um, the, one of the difficulties, Mr. Newell, is that at the round table meetings that we had, I, as a matter of course, started out by saying these discussions are private. Uh, that was, wasn't always on them, by the way, but, the, uh, but I said as a matter of course. So at least uh, already, they're not, there's not, I don't think we were required to sign the NDAs, but, uh, but generally speaking, and that's why you won't find any companies identified, but you're right in principle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vera Hophouse, one question. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for coming, Secretary of State, which must be a difficult session for you and for delaying you. Um, can you just explain... It's a difficult time, not a difficult session. No. Can, can, can you just um, explain where, in your mind, this misunderstanding arose from that um, the, the House and the public at large thought there were impact assessments, um, and yet there weren't impact assessments. Where did this misunderstanding come from? Well, you, you have to put that to that question to the people who use the phrase impact assessment. Okay. I may be at fault. I may be at fault myself for not correcting, for example, Ms. Maholtra, uh, the last meeting when she she kept talking about impact assessments, and I was assuming she meant sexual analysis, which is the only phrase I've used. Um, but in the in the in the uh, in the debate in the House, I'm sure Mr. Walker did make that point. Okay, Sammy Wilson. One. Chairman, I think just to get the public record straight, uh, Peter indicated that there was no um, denial of uh, sectoral or impact assessments during the debate. Actually, um, the minister did, yeah. on two occasions, say that there were no such yeah, assessments uh, during the debate. Can I just ask, uh, Mr. is there any intention of carrying out a similar analysis for regions uh, yeah. as well as uh, for different sectors? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, there will be as we as we come. I mean, the, in the first instance, the 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 mechanism for uh, uh, involving the nations as well as as well as the regions would be the JMC. Right? And just with respect to your own particular interest, <coughs> Mr. Wilson, of course, we haven't had um, political representation from the NIE, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive, since the election. Um, uh, but that's the first stage, and so we have. That's one of the reasons I gave these documents to the devolved administrations. Uh, and we will, in conjunction with them, talk through what the, what the specific implications to them are. For example, agriculture in Northern Ireland, 10 times as important as the rest of the country. For example, uh, Scotland, dependent to some extent, more extent than most, on, on, on migrant labour for certain categories. Those things will be dealt with uh, uh, as, we, as we go through the mechanisms, as we go through the process. Okay. Just finally, did the government undertake an assessment of the economic impact of leaving the customs union before the cabinet took that decision? Not, not a formal quantitative one. Not. Uh, not a formal quantitative. One. Not a formal one. Quantitative. So there was no formal assessment of the economic assessment. impact. No quantitative assessment. There's, a, there's obviously a judgment made on qualitative things, but not a quantitative one. Isn't that? Quite extraordinary, given the no, momentous no, nature no, of that decision. No, there are phenomenal numbers of variables in that, Mr. Mr. Okay. Chairman. I, I actually related some, relayed some of them to you in the last meeting I was at, when I took you through, for example, the impact of free trade agreements. And I said to you, if I remember correctly, that uh, a typical free trade agreement could increase trade by 25 percent, but NAFTA by by 40 percent. And and that's the sort of range of things you have to do. But they're qualitatively different. So the free trade agreements carried out by the European Union have not been particularly beneficial to the United Kingdom. The, uh, the free trade agreements carried out by, this, by Switzerland, a much smaller country, have been fantastically beneficial to it. So we would have to make a judgment about the difference of uh, effectiveness of ourselves in, the <coughs> in that uh, upcoming relationship. Those sorts of judgments were taken into account. Well, thank you very much for coming today, Sir. So I apologise that we've run a little over time. Thank you for bearing with us. My pleasure, as always, for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman, and uh, forgive my voice. But you know, the the the, the, va the vagaries of talking to lots of people all the time. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Good morning. Welcome, uh, and especially warm welcome, on you, belatedly on your appointment and Thank on you your first appearance before the Select Committee. Thank you very much for coming along here today. We, we look forward on other occasions to questioning you about other matters rather than the issue that is um, we're applying our minds to today. Could I begin by just asking you to let us know? I think the Secretary of State passed one or two questions to you in the answers we just heard. What instructions were given to your civil servants and civil servants from other government departments in drawing up the material that has been passed to the committee? Um, uh, thank you, Chair. It's very straightforward. I think the Secretary of State has given you um, uh, the gist of that. Um, clearly, uh, the basis of the reports you've got are founded on the work that was started um, soon after the referendum. Um, the instructions given to the departments was to uh, bring that uh, material up to date to make sure it, it was of maximum utility to the committee, but to remove from it anything that was commercially market or negotiation sensitive. So, and there was a bit of structuring done uh, to ensure that there was a consistency across, across those reports, but the, uh, the endeavour was to make them as user-friendly, if you like, for the committee um, uh, based on the original work that was done, um, responding to the evolution of that work over time. So it was a relatively straightforward instruction. Of course, this was done at some speed um, and the results you have in front of you. Well, given that, as the Secretary of State made clear in his letter to me, and uh, it says in the introduction to all of the 39 sections, does not contain commercially market or negotiation sensitive information, did you receive any representations from other government departments expressing any reservation about this material being put in the public domain? So we, we had a very iterative process um, with other government departments in terms of the, um, uh, the finalising of these, of the, these reports. Uh, and clearly they made their judgments based on the knowledge of the, um, what they'd heard from uh, uh, particular stakeholders and so on of what material might be, uh, might be sensitive. Um, but the, uh, all departments have followed uh, those instructions very, uh, very closely. Um, uh, as the Secretary of State said, if, if this material was to go into the public domain, uh, it would offer some reassurance to me and to my contacts in other departments if we could have a last, if you like, look over it just to make sure that there's nothing inadvertently left in, particularly in, to, in terms of commercial sensitivity. But um, I'm confident that the bulk of the material um, does not contain anything that breaches those guidelines that were given to departments. That is very helpful. Stephen Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mycroft, for coming to see us today. Um, I'm just interested in the uh, wording of the 1st of November motion, which was, of course, passed unanimously by the House and ruled as binding by the Speaker. Uh, and I know, obviously, as a, as a civil servant, you're not involved in the political discussions that are taking place between ministers and whips, but were you aware of the wording of that motion um, at, an, uh, you know, at a stage at which you could potentially, you feel, have intervened and said to ministers, well, the House is asking for something that doesn't exist. Um, the response to a motion like that is uh, obviously for the, uh, the political side of the government to deal with. Um, uh, I personally wasn't aware at that, at, of the, the terms of the motion um, when it came forward, um, but the decision on how to respond to the motion um, is one that was taken uh, by uh, the Chief Whip, as the Secretary of State said, uh, and the government, the political side of the government as a whole, um, and not by civil servants. Can you maybe just talk us through your thoughts then when you uh, did see that motion and uh, you realised that you were being asked, in essence, to by the House on the basis of a binding and unanimously passed motion to provide information to the committee that does not exist. Did you, did you not find that to be a somewhat odd state of affairs? Um, a, a little bit odd. Um, I, 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 my initial thought was, well, how do we provide information to the committee uh, that is useful? So what process could we put in place um, uh, that overcomes the fact that there aren't those impact assessments, but nevertheless uh, assures the committee that there are sectoral analyses which are thorough and full 
and competent um, and to, in order to, if you like, meet the spirit uh, of the humble address and that's the process we embarked on. Thanks. Just a final question. Um, just to d dig in a little bit on this definition of what an impact mm. assessment is uh, and in, in your view as obviously a very highly experienced uh, civil servant. I mean, I don't know what, you know, the, the, the semantics of the better regulations unit definition which the, the Secretary of State just shared with us, but I would have thought there'd be a pretty much a common sense, if you like, layman's definition is it would need to be something that outlines the expected costs and benefits of a scenario or a set of scenarios and says you know, that, that surely is the definition of impact and how you assess that impact. Would you agree with that or could, could you share with the committee what, how, how would you define what an impact assessment actually is? Um, um, as, as you know, um, uh, the civil servants are sort of um, creatures of, of guidance and of, um, and of form and there is actually a very formal definition of what an impact assessment is. Rightly so, because those impact assessments inform the decisions that are taken um, uh, in Parliament about legislation and regulation. And, and the, the form that has been devised, um, guided by um, the Regulatory Policy Committee over time, um, has been honed to make sure that the information that Parliament receives at the moment it takes decisions on specific regulatory and legislative propositions um, is well informed by an understanding of the impact of those propositions. So um, I have here the Cabinet Office Legislative Guidance extract from Chapter 14. It does give quite a detailed technical description of what we think of as impact assessments. Um, so the issue we're dealing with in, as we come into the negotiation, of course, is that there is a huge, as the Secretary of State again has said, there is a huge variety of variables and applying judgment to those in terms of informing the decisions uh, that ministers might take. Actually, the impact assessment methodology is not as useful in that context as it is uh, when you're describing the cost benefits of a specific proposition, um, which is to uh, be decided on uh, by Parliament. So that is the, the uh, that's what guides the guidance, if you like. So when you ask civil servants about in impact assessments, they immediately go uh, to that guidance. Just worth saying, I mean, there is an impact assessment of the withdrawal bill, for example, um, and we are, you know, duty bound to uh, to do those impact assessments for all uh, major and indeed minor legislative propositions. Thank you. Okay, just just on that point, we heard the Secretary of State earlier say very clearly, no impact assessments have been undertaking. There hadn't been an assessment of the economic impact of leaving the customs union. In your experience as a civil servant, have you ever? come across a range of decisions that government has taken of such significance when no as impact assessments or assessments of the impact, it seems, have been undertaken? Um, I, in my experience as a civil servant, Chair, I've never encountered such a range of circumstances as those we're encountering at the moment. So we are in... Well, that is certainly uh, true, yes. We are in sort of unprecedented territory. I would say I have had quite a lot of experience within internal governance issues within the United Kingdom. Um, for example, um, um, uh, supporting the passage of, of, I think now, four devolution bills through Parliament. Um, when you're engaged in these big political decisions about the sort of shape of future relationships, um, you, clearly it is, it is very difficult to, um, to do a precise economic um, uh, or impact ass uh, 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 assessment uh, analysis of those decisions. So many factors come into play. Um, so in the, the sort of more honest answer to your question is, yes, I have encountered um, uh, very major decisions taken that impacts on the future of the country um, where a very precise economic analysis of the sort that you're, I think, hinting at has been very difficult uh, to do. So these decisions, um, from the point of view of the civil service, clearly the broad effect, the broad impact um, uh, is something that we do, uh, we do work on with ministers, but ultimately you're taking decisions um, in, uh, in space uh, where the, the political decision making has to inform uh, the direction of travel and ultimately the decisions that are taken. Okay, thank you. How Williams. Thank you. Good morning. Um, how confident are you that the territorial departments, the Wales Office and the Scotland Office were involved, fully engaged in producing these documents? Because I have to say, you know, the references which I sought 
looking through them to the extent that I did. They were rather sparse. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you for that question. And I can give you absolute assurance that the Scotland Office and the Wales Office, and indeed the Northern Ireland Office, uh, the UK Government Territorial <coughs> Departments, were fully engaged in this process, actually right from the start, um, when the original process kicked off. Um, I was at that point running the UK Governance Group, um, which included the Scotland Office and the Wales Office. Um, as well as the Constitution Group and the Cabinet Office. And one of my jobs was to make sure that the thinking, not just in DEXU, but right the way across government, was informed by an understanding of where the sectoral and economic interests lie um, in the devolved parts of the UK. Um, and if you look through the reports, um, clearly um, the reports do, in uh, most instances, I would hope the majority of instances, reflect uh, where those important economic interests lie. So, for example, on the steel side, and um, from the Welsh perspective, um, if you look at the fish report and so on and so forth, quite a number of them uh, break down the employment and economic uh, impact of where the information is available. It's not always available as, uh, um, uh, by uh, each part of the UK, but where that information is available, um, some of the reports included. Mm. Can, can I just refer to an answer that we got from Laura Dunlop? You see, as she said very briefly, she said, who speaks for England? Now, were the other departments sufficiently appraised that in some respects they were speaking for the UK and in some respects they were speaking for England? I'm thinking specific perhaps of health, for example. Yes. Um, as far as um, UK government departments are concerned, the sort of clue is a little bit in the title. Um, they are UK government departments. They have to think about the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, clearly, um, when you go into devolved um, domains, the, the, uh, the Department of Health, the Department for Education, for example, um, a lot of the knowledge, their knowledge and understanding will relate specifically um, to uh, the running of the health service in England or the running of the education services in England. Uh, if information is required at a macro level there for the whole of the United Kingdom, it is their job, supported by the territorial offices, supported by the cabinet office, in this instance supported by DEXU, uh, to ensure that they talk to the devolved administrations uh, and they garner from them uh, the relevant information in order to create the, whole, the picture for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and I have to say Whitehall has uh, got a lot better at that over the last, the last four or five years. Um, and uh, through a lot of hard work, um, uh, departments do understand um, uh, both the necessity of talking closely to the devolved administrations and also understanding uh, the cross-UK effect of the policies that they're pursuing. I mean, it leads on to my last question, really. Um, so were the uh, governments in Wales and in Scotland engaged in any way in producing these documents? Were they consulted? Do they contribute opinions? Yeah. And just lastly, uh, do you know why the Welsh Government has therefore commissioned its own assessments? Um, I can't answer for the Welsh Government. What I can say is that there has, um, at an official level, been extensive contact um, with colleagues in the devolved administrations throughout this process um, in order to understand, for them to understand what we're doing and for us to understand their take on where the economic and other interests of the devolved parts of the UK lie. And I hope you would see that reflected uh, in the reports. And as the Secretary of State said, uh, the, the, the political side of that, um, captured in the JMC, uh, EN, particularly European negotiations machi machinery, in order to ensure that there are opportunities at the political level as well as the official level uh, to discuss these very important issues. I. Um, chair a, a regular meeting at least once a month with the permanent secretaries from the devolved administrations, uh, not least to give them the opportunity to say, we think we're falling behind a little bit on the work that's gone on, could you please accelerate the contact in this domain or the other in order that we can give the advice we need to give uh, to our ministers. Um, this is contested territory, as we know from the discussion of the bill uh, on Monday in terms of the returning powers and so on. Uh, but in that space as well, a huge amount of work in terms of the discussion of UK frameworks of the returning powers at both political and official level. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Christopher Chubb. Thank you. Has uh, your department or the government made any assessment of <coughs> the value of this material before us uh, that we could sell to the EU in an open market situation? <laughs> Um, I, a, idea. <laughs> a very interesting question, if I may. Um, 
No. Uh, the, the, the straight answer is no, we have not <laughs> done that. Um, uh, I am not sure what price that they would put on it. It, um, uh, it comes back to what the Secretary of State uh, said earlier on. Uh, this does represent a huge amount of work across government. Clearly, it's not the sole um, uh, uh, sort of archive, you like, of the work that has been done across government. It does have immense value. Uh, it is the foundation stone, if you like, for all of the analysis we're doing that supports the advice we give to ministers on their negotiating strategy. Um, uh, I'm sure we could ask the Commission, but I'm not sure that they would give us an answer. <coughs> because, I mean, there's a serious point behind this. This has been funded by the UK taxpayer. Sure. Uh, and we, we know that the European Commission is not making its own equivalent uh, material available uh, to us on a reciprocal uh, basis. And so, so why, why should we be effectively offering this uh, material to the EU when they're not prepared to offer anything to us? It, would there not be something to be said for actually having uh, an another sort of the subsidiary area of negotiation based upon let's uh, have mutual exchange, rather like you would in a court case, mutual exchange of <coughs> documents which are not um, conf confidential? Yeah, you, you're quite right. The, the, um, the Commission will, of course, do its own analysis as it would do um, as it heads into any major negotiation. Um, and uh, so my experience of the Commission, uh, certainly in the run-up to the negotiation before they get into the, uh, the sort of triaging with Member States and so on, it would not be their habit to put that sort of material uh, into the public domain. Um, so there is a decision for the com Committee to make, it's not my decision, the Secretary of State said, it's obviously for the Committee to make about what to do with this material. I would not anticipate the Commission reciprocating. And do you think the Commission would make its material available to the parliaments of the other 27 EU countries? Um, depends on what stage the material has reached, but I would, I would uh, not anticipate from what, again, I know what the way the Commission operates, the Commission put in anything um, to other parliaments if they, th if they thought that material was sensitive, and by giving it to other parliaments, it might find its way into the public domain. Because there's a certain sort of partisan element to this, isn't it? even in the European Parliament, because when we went to take evidence from the European Parliament, we were told that the Brexit steering group, about which we heard earlier, that uh, members of the European Conservatives and Reformists are not allowed to sit on the Brexit steering group because they do not support wholeheartedly the EU policy. So isn't that another example of partiality? Um, I, I really not my judgment call about the way that the European Parliament operates and the way that it makes its decisions, but I think the point, the, the fundamental point that you make is that I would not anticipate um, getting from the European Commission um, something akin to that, which was, if you like, their analysis, not just of the, uh, what their analysis of the UK interests in all of this, but also their analysis of the interests of other member states. And, and that is information, clearly, that we are interested in, and we will do our own work to understand uh, where the economic uh, effect is, if you like, in other parts of the EU. Um, if the Commission was to provide us with that file, it would save us an awful lot of work, but I doubt that they will. So, so finally, can I just ask you whether it would be possible for you to provide the, this committee uh, with the best estimate of the financial value of this information? I couldn't put a financial value on it. Um, civil service time um, uh, doesn't, we don't count our hours quite the way that um, consultants do, so uh, it would be a very, very big exercise in its own right to uh, add up all of those hours, weekends late into the night um, that people have put in to produce this material for you, but it is a large cost. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Just for the information of Mr Rycroft and the committee, you referred to the European Parliament, Chris. They did publish an assessment of the economic impact of Brexit on the EU27 in March 2017, which I must admit I haven't read yet, but we will circulate that so yes. that members of the committee can have a look. Can uh, Steve? Can I just ask, I mean, when you say they circulated a report on the economic impact of Brexit, so what sort of Brexit were they talking about, or how many different sorts of Brexit? Well, how could they make an assessment? Well, I don't know what, what we'd have to ask. What the future trading them. agreement is going to be? It has sections on to the various heart of what we're discussing today. Preferential uh, models, simple free trade agreement, customs union, Swiss model, comprehensive economic and trade agreement, deep and comprehensive free trade area. It's just a point of information. That's all. Since we were discussing who's produced what. Now, Stephen Crabb is next. Good morning, Steve. Decision not to commission 
impact assessments? I mean, it feels like a pretty specific, deliberate decision. At what point was that decision in government made? Was that a July 2016 decision right at the beginning of the process, or is that a much more recent posture that the government struck? No, um, uh, uh, thank you for the question. It, 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 I don't think at any point. So the early days clearly was um, I wasn't part of decision-making I was involved in, but as far as I understand, there was never a decision not to produce impact assessments. There was a decision to produce sectoral analysis um, because I think at, uh, at that point, as now, people understanding the difference between um, developing our, our understanding of the different sectors, the value to the UK economy, how the regulatory environment works, how trade is facilitated in those sectors, all the information in there, that's what we were pursuing. Uh, and at the, in the early days, as in the later days, in a sense, an impact assessment uh, would have been a diversion of activity into a frame which would not ultimately have given ministers the sort of information that they might require, uh, given the uncertainties involved at that stage and uh, as we've worked through this. So um, I think the direct answer to your question, it was not, if you like, that there was a decision taken not to do impact assessments. It was a positive decision taken to do sectoral analysis. So, so when, when the word went out across departments commissioning this very significant body of work, which we're now calling the sectoral analysis, it, as part of the guidance, did the guidance not, did it stipulate that beware Department of Bays with all the work that you're going to be doing on the automotive sector, sector don't get into the business of doing an impact assessment? Well, again, every, every civil servant, if the, you mention the word impact assessment, would go to the sort of guidance I've described to you, and that was not part of the brief of the remit um, for the generation of this work. Okay. Right. Uh, Stephen Timms. Uh, thank you. The Secretary of State has told us that the, the documents that we've received have been compiled from the government sectoral reports, which are a bit larger than what we've had. He said you'd be able to tell us how many pages, or you know, roughly what proportion of the total material that we've received here. I wonder if I could invite you to tell us that. So, um, yes, I was sort of prepped for that question, clearly. Um, um, in terms of the rough order of magnitude, if you took a snapshot of the material that was available um, relatively early in this process, um, you'd be looking at about roughly the same volume. Um, but uh, the point I would like to emphasise in all of this, or well, two things. One is, what you see here has a direct lineage to that early work. Um, it has been brought up to date, as I said earlier on, uh, negotiation, commercial market sensitive material has been taken out of it. But if you think about it as if you like the foundation for a huge amount of other work that has continued and, uh, and, and moves forward in, in terms of informing uh, the decisions that ministers take, we draw on uh, this sectoral analysis constantly to inform that further work. Um, but what we're not depriving you of, if you like, is, is a stack of 17, 18 lever arch files uh, which are sitting there from, if you like, July, September or whatever last year, in terms of the sexual studies themselves. No, but I mean, the Secretary said, told us that most of the material is, is here. I'm just yes. wondering what proportion is. Are we talking about, you know, is it three quarters I, is here? Is it 90%? Is it? In, in terms of the, the sort of the detail of the sectors, I would say you have the majority of the material. So in, if you look at the way that the thing has been pieced together, um, uh, the analysis of the sectors, uh, you will have the majority of that material. That will have been updated. Um, uh, the impact, the regulatory impacts and so on and so forth. So you have in these files uh, the majority of the factual material um, that was put, has been pulled together um, from the off from July uh, 2016, uh, uh, 2016 through to now. As I say, the, what has been removed from it is the stuff that is negotiation, commercial, etc. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of pages, roughly what proportion of the material that's been removed? Um, I, 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 I can't give you a, an, an, a, an absolute number on that, but in, in rough proportion, you are seeing um, our full versions of the sectoral analysis. So we have not removed, if you like, whole, whole swathes of material. Um, uh, that pertain to the purpose of these documents because that material um, is informing our work and it's material that was relevant to uh, uh, for the committee in terms of the government's response to the humble address. Right, I, I'm now getting a bit confused because I, I thought the Secretary of State told us that there had been an exercise of going through the sectoral reports and taking out 
the things on those three yeah. criteria, and the rest has, has come to us. I'm, I'm just wondering, in roughly, in terms of size, yeah, how much of the material has been removed and most So, it, uh, to give you a sort of a sense of that, this isn't, hasn't been an exercise in sort of ripping out whole chapters or whole sections. If you had an um, analysis of uh, the stakeholder response, there might have been a reference to a company sure. um, saying yeah. Yeah. company A believes that this would have this or that impact on yes. them and that might yes. have a share price impact yeah. or whatever it is. That's taking out a sentence or indeed it's turning that sentence to there is concern in the sector that such and such thing might happen. So the, in, term, in a sense, the, this is a qualitative rather than a quantitative assessment, if I could put it like that, of going through the reports and making sure the material does not contain that sensitive stuff in it. Yeah. It hasn't actually reduced the volume of the material substantially. What it has done um, has it improved uh, the material in terms of uh, the, the sensitivity of it, but also the work that has been done uh, to update, update the material. Again, that might not have been... So we've, we've perhaps got 95% or something I, like that. I would, if I was to put a rough en, em, uh, estimate on it, I would say somewhere in, in the order of magnitude 80, 90% of the 80, material in right. terms of volume. It's not, you're not missing in terms of the analysis. Um, no, that, that was all. I, just, I thought it was a roughly 80, 90% is, is very helpful. Can I just ask, the, the Secretary of State has made it clear to us he doesn't, uh, he takes rather a dim view of economic modelling. Mm. Um, has have other government departments undertaken economic modelling of the impact of different versions of Brexit on the sectors for which they are responsible? Um, so uh, there is a lot of work going on to understand the broad effect of uh, uh, of um, EU exit. Um, there are economic models around, as the Treasury notoriously had economic mo uh, models that they deployed um, in the run-up to uh, to the referendum. Um, the question about what they're doing uh, for their own Secretaries of State is a question you would have to put uh, to them. What we need to do in DEXU uh, is to understand the broad range uh, of what uh, uh, the economic analysis is saying externally uh, and to ensure that Ministers understand that uh, and to have a broad understanding of um, uh, the, the, economic in, uh, uh, the, the economic effect um, of how this might unfold. But the, the, the point that Secretary of State was making is that at this stage of the negotiations, there are so many variables in the possible outcomes, yes. uh, yep. not just, if you like, in terms of the future relationship with the EU, uh, but also in our future relationship, as per the other question, um, um, with uh, third countries and what our trading relationships might be. My, uh, my question really was, I mean, you've told us that you, you chair a, a government-wide uh, group of, uh, of senior civil servants. In the course of that, have, uh, have you become aware of economic model work being undertaken by other government departments to so, inform? You're certainly aware that, that other government departments are looking at the um, where they're responsible for particular sectors. Clearly, yeah. they are thinking about the, if you like, the, 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 the quantitative as well as the qualitative impact so they are uh, of those. Uh, whether that, again, that's a question, that how, whether, what you describe as modelling, I'm not going to put a definition on that. If you want to know precisely what they're doing, you'd have to ask them about what they're doing. It, my job is to, if you like, aggregate that understanding in a way that informs the decisions that ministers make about their negotiating strategy. And because of the number of variables in this, um, uh, as the Secretary of State said, you can't put in your foot on any particular economic model. The risk is that quite quickly you begin to sink deep into it because of the number of variables, the number of uncertainties in it. Um, so there are a whole series of judgments that ministers ultimately have to take, informed by the work we do, on the possible effects um, across the whole range of circumstance of the choices that might be made. Okay, thank you very much. Jeremy Lefroy. Thank you very much. Um, just referring to an earlier statement you made, Mr. Rycroft, you talked about the civil service preparing detailed impact assessments for Parliament prior to taking major decisions. The, the result of the negotiations will, at some point, probably next year, come to Parliament in some form or other uh, for a final decision. Clearly, the impact assessment at that point is going to be absolutely crucial. What form and how extensive would you 
at this stage expect that impact assessment to be and would you expect it to have a very substantial quantitative content? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer at this stage because what I can't do is to peer into the, into, uh, into the future next year and determine precisely what would be put to Parliament and when as an outcome of negotiations that have not yet started. Um, but I would expect when um, the challenge to, to me and my team when we get to that point, um, both for any uh, legislation that Parliament might be looking at um, uh, um, or, or any other um, decision that motion that the Parliament might be looking at, decision that Parliament might be uh, expected to take, um, that, that I would expect to be guided by the formal guidance on impact assessments, uh, certainly for formal legislation, and to follow that guidance. But precisely what form that might take um, really depends on precisely what Parliament will be looking at. Given that the decision that is being taken has been taken and the way in which it is implemented in the coming months is uh, one of the most substantial taken by Parliament in many decades, would you expect the kind of information available to Parliament when taking that decision to be at least as substantial, if not more substantial, than we receive, for instance, on an annual budget, for an annual budget? Uh, again, that I, I can't give you a precise, it would be um, misleading of me to give you a precise answer to that because I, I can't prejudge precisely what the form of that decision uh, will be, how far uh, we've reached in the negotiations, what shape that has taken, what decision Parliament has been uh, asked to take. Um, certainly what I can say, and as we've done with the withdrawal bill and will do for all other Brexit related legislation that becomes uh, before the, the, House, uh, the Houses of Parliament, uh, that we will go through the formal impact assessment process and doubtless Parliament will judge us on the quality of those impact assessments. So we are bound to do that and that is what we will do, but precisely what form that will take will clearly depend on um, uh, what, uh, where we are, what sort of negotiation has been done, what are the outcome of, of that has been, and uh, what question has been put to Parliament. And just finally yes, on, of course. on that, uh, yeah. Mr Chairman, um, this clearly it would be an impact assessment beyond any other legislative impact assessment that has been uh, drawn up to date. Are you already preparing for the scale of the resources in terms of time and people required to produce an impact assessment commensurate with the importance of the legislation? Um, in a sense, you're asking me about you know, the whole work of, uh, uh, of, of my department and all of the work we do obviously related to exit. Um, ultimately understanding what is the best in, in the, the best interest of the country, uh, our job to advise ministers on that uh, as we go into a, a negotiation. Clearly we can't predict precisely where we'll come out of that negotiation, uh, but every step of the way um, our work is informed by um, uh, the understanding of what ultimately will be in the best interests of the country and how we prepare to deliver a smooth exit um, um, over, the, over the course of time. So um, there will be at some point a summation of that work, I expect, um, but it, in a way it's not a discrete piece of work that I've sort of carved off a bit. The department said you, st you start on that now because it involves really pretty much the whole range of the, the, of the departments I have the privilege of looking after as well as lots of other bits of Whitehall. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Peter Barrett. What Mr. Timms was asking you, um, you sir, um, you started by saying that we had the majority of the information here, um, and that could be sort of, you know, 55, 45 percent. You narrowed it down a bit to say 20 percent or 10 percent being retained. There's quite a significant difference between one in five pages missing or one in ten pages missing, and certainly a great deal of difference from majority. So could you perhaps narrow it down a bit further? Are we closer, say, to 90% than 80%? <laughs> um, without having gone through and actually done it sort of page by page, I would be slightly leery of giving you a very, very precise, if you like, page number um, response to that. I th the important point on this is that, the, as I said earlier on, the material that has come out 
um, has been the sensitive material which has been marbled through these reports. And some of that, you may have a paragraph would come out, some of that will have been question change in two or three words, maybe, to remove that sensitive information. Um, in the updating of the material, there won't have been a significant shortening of the material. There will have been, hopefully, a significant improve, uh, improvement in the quality of the material to ensure that the information uh, that the committee has um, is, is up-to-date information. Um, we could go through and do a page count. Um, I'm not sure it would add much to your knowledge of the, of, the, uh, of the basis of these reports. The assurance I can give you um, is that comparing um, in terms of the information that was in the original reports uh, to the information that you have uh, in the reports now, um, that, the, 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 uh, that you have the substantive information on the sectors, on the regulatory impact, uh, or the, the regulatory management of those sectors, how it works in trade space, um, and indeed uh, the summation of the stakeholder views on it. Um, so in terms of the quality of the reports, I am very confident uh, that that matches, uh, if you like, uh, like for like, um, in terms of where the starting point wa uh, was, uh, but improved in order to bring the stuff up to date. Jim, that's very interesting, the words of gives a sort of reassurance as though there's not much missing. So if there isn't much missing, why is we still talking about maybe only 80%? Um, if, you're, if you're so very confident that really qualitatively and you know, only an odd sentence or paragraph has been removed, why can't you say as much more than 90% of it? <laughs> um, because I haven't gone through and counted the pages. And when we're at the difference between 85, 90, 95%, um, Have uh, I got you up to 85%? If somebody comes back and says, well, actually, it was 82, 83, I mean, I, I'm not sure how far we can take this debate. All I right, think I'm, the I'm, we'll move thing, on then. Yeah. Can I just say that, let's put it the other way around, Chairman. If the government changes its opinion and decides to give us all the papers, how much more are we likely to get? Uh, in quantitative terms, um, as I said, not a lot. Well, let's say in number terms, then. Number of pages, for instance. I have said I can't give you a number of pages. I am doing my best to uh, give you, a, uh, in a sense, the spirit of your question is, is the material that is before you, um, does, it, does it accurately reflect the starting point for this exercise? Yes, it does. Have we taken out stuff okay, that might Okay, I've got that me? point. Thank you. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, can I just then... Just on one particular point that's just slightly worrying me, I've talked about this in general terms. Is there any one sector where a sig very significant amount of detail has been removed? Um, uh, from my uh, knowledge of it, the answer is no. Okay. We, we do seem to be chasing a number of very elusive things during our evidence sessions this morning, but uh, Seema Malhotra. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Ryan, for coming today. Could I ask a slightly different question? What proportion of the material that we've been given is material that was previously written, and what proportion would you say has been written in the last three or four weeks? Uh, so the, uh, all of these reports are based on uh, the original work. And again, it's just the understanding of the process that government is going through here. That the um, what is the purpose of this material? The purpose of this material is to give ministers an understanding um, of the interests of different sectors, the sh size and shape of those sectors, the impact on the economy. So, so you'd say maybe 60% was what I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm sort of slightly reluctant to be pursued down a numerical path. I think the point is that the, um, uh, the, uh, the analysis that has been done, it is the quality of the analysis uh, that matters. What you have before you um, is that analysis that has been updated in order to give you a better quality product. What we've not done is abstracted yes. from it anything that would give you information uh, about the size and shape of the sector, the value to the economy, uh, the regulatory context in which it sits, um, uh, and how it works in the I, trade I context. Understand. The reason why this is important is because it starts to look like the material has been written in order to seek to ostensibly comply with the motion in Parliament 
rather than provide reports that have been seen by ministers and the secretary uh, and, and the prime minister and cabinet committee. So uh, it, it would be helpful. I'm, I'm sure it's. I'm sure there is a straightforward answer. Uh, we've all been in situations. I've worked in the civil service as well. I understand you write reports and they might get um, <coughs> tweaked or updated or just brought up to date. But largely, you know, 80, 90 percent of them, for example might be original material. Um, so in respect of the motion itself, as the Secretary of State said, that motion asked for impact assessments. It didn't ask for sexual studies. So what we have done is provided the sexual studies in the spirit of the motion, and we brought those up to date in order to give you, the committee, the information uh, that the, the government ultimately thought was useful for your considerations. Um, there wouldn't have been a lot of point in giving you out of date information because then that would have you know, set off a whole series of questions of why, why the information is out of date. The Secretary of State indicated that some of the analysis perhaps wasn't of the highest quality, so clearly we've taken the opportunity to make sure it is of a standard quality. I, I, I understand that and I, I appreciate that and, and clearly um, a lot of work has gone into these. I, I'll only just make this point and then I, 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 I just want to move on to one other uh, question with you that would it not have been really for this committee to decide whether or not the material that was out of date was too out of date or was incomplete? And would that not be actually quite important to understand in terms of the quality of information that was being used to inform policy yeah. in your department? I, I, I think given that that relates to the relationship between the committee and uh, the Secretary of State, that was a question probably more for the Secretary of State uh, than for me. Uh, do you do you believe that policy coming out of your department is evidence based? Absolutely. Um, we undertake a huge amount of work to ensure that it is properly evidence based. Um, we have a team of uh, analysts who um, will pour over the, the data from different sectors. And as the Secretary of State said, we spend a huge amount of time talking to businesses and other interests to understand. Um, uh, how they see this process uh, of exit and where they think their interests lie. It is absolutely central to the work that we do uh, that we have that evidence uh, to inform so the decisions that are taken by the, ministers. The Secretary of State confirmed to me that he had said that if there's no deal, that we would be short, fall short of a deal, that we'd be ready for the alternative. That's what a responsible government does. And anything else would be a dereliction of duty. Has there been any other analysis or evidence provided to the Secretary of State on, for example, the impact of no deal, if he's made, making those statements in public and Parliament? So you, you take us into a, another domain of work which I'm responsible for in the departments and as it happens uh, your colleagues on the Public uh, uh, Affairs Committee will be cross-examining me on precisely that point on Monday next week because they've produced a report which looks at um, the 300 or so work streams that we're conducting across governments or uh, we're helping to coordinate across government uh, which look at uh, the preparedness um, uh, to deal with any exit scenario. So there is, again, a huge amount of work being undertaken uh, in that space and we give advice constantly to ministers on the state of that work, the implications of that work and ergo what decisions at what point ministers will need to take in order to ensure that we are ready for exit um, of any description. Okay. So, um, just one very, very really small quickly question. I just want, to, just want to clarify this then. So if in the end, or currently, if, you, if we don't know the impact of no deal on the economy and we're talking about no deal, um, wouldn't, with 16 months to go and businesses and families needing confidence in what the government is doing and how well prepare, we're preparing, would this not get very close to what the Secretary of State has described as a dereliction of duty? Um, I see absolutely no dereliction of duty on behalf of part of ministers or of civil servants. Um, there is a vast amount of work going on across government to prepare for both the negotiations uh, and the outcome of those negotiations, whatever they might be. Um, that is what I have a very brilliant team of uh, coming up to 600 folk in Dexu now um, who help coordinate that work across government. 
uh, but every department impacted by this is putting in um, a huge amount of effort to uh, uh, help guide the decisions that ministers will take about our, uh, uh, the way that we approach the negotiations and hopefully therefore to shape the outcome that is in the best interest of the country. Okay. Thank you. Peter Grant. Thank you. Can I go back to the, the definition of when is an impact assessment, not an impact assessment? You've referred us to Chapter 14 of a publication titled The Guide to Making Legislation, published by the Current Office in July 2017. Would it be fair to say that Chapter 14 of that document does not set out to give a general definition as to what an impact assessment is? It's more by way of requirements and guidance as to what needs to be included within the specific context of making legislation. Um, exactly, and this is, but this is what, what I was saying to you. People, uh, you know, when we think about impact assessments, um, the, uh, the frame of reference for that um, is the approach we take um, to um, uh, putting before Parliament uh, the assessment of the costs and benefits of particular pieces of regulation um, and legislation, so that informs the decisions that Parliament uh, takes. Um, this is designed for a, a very particular stage in the decision-making process of government, and it is generally applied um, to, if you like, um, specific propositions, which are bounded propositions. It's a very different matter to apply that methodology um, to a very open domain of policy making where the number of variables um, is huge and where the number of those variables has not narrowed down uh, to a point where you can do that very precise uh, um, impact assessment, cost benefit analysis. Thank you for that. Um, the International Association for Impact Assessment, who we would imagine might know a thing or two about this, um, have published a definition in which they say that impact assessment simply defined as, and I quote, the process of identifying the future consequences of a current or proposed action, end of quote. Using that more general and I would expect more publicly understood definition, have the government carried out an impact assessment of Brexit and its potential scenario was under that definition? Um, it, that's not the definition we use. So I'm, I'm sorry. No, but sorry. Be, with sorry. respect to Bill, can I raise yeah. the question? Have the government done work that would fit within that definition of impact assessment, even if the Cabinet Office wouldn't? The, the work that we do within the government, as I say, um, sorry to be creature of habit on this, is not impact assessments as we define them. Uh, but in terms of the broad understanding of uh, the interests of different sectors, uh, the effects of different exit scenarios, clearly we are working across the range in order to inform ministerial decision making on its negotiating strategy um, and what it pursues in the course of those negotiations. Okay. I think we are unfortunately going to have to conclude at this point. Can I just ask you, the Secretary of State told us he hadn't read the documents in front yes. of us. Have you read them? I have read the documents. Um, them. Uh, uh, I can't claim to have read every last no, no, page, I, but I have read the you've documents. Read them. Okay, I was well, that's helpful. That, uh, refreshing well members of the committee. Of documents, not uh, just last night. Yeah. Could I just say to you this? The, the Secretary State indicated to us um, that he thought there was nothing that would preclude publication, but I indicated to him that we would come back in line with the commitment I had given to him personally on behalf of the committee to give you one last look, can I just say to you, uh, if that's what the committee decides to do, a, a very speedy turnaround yes. would be required by the committee yes. uh, in order to give us the information we need to reach that decision. And with that, um, <coughs> which is I'm sure a point you appreciate, can I thank you for appearing before us today and could you pass on from the committee our thanks to you and your colleagues because we know you are doing an enormous amount of work in very testing and difficult circumstances. And despite the sharpness of some of our questions, we really are extremely grateful. I, um, that would not just appreciated by me, but um, appreciated by um, the very hard-working civil servants in Dexu and well beyond. Indeed. And in response to your other point, Chair, I can assure you that if you instruct us to turn something around quickly, we will do we'll just do that. Splendid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Order, order.